Hello, and welcome to the Cube Studio here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. Got a great conversation around generative AI, risk management, the role of compliance as an enabler, not a blocker. Emery Kazim is the co-founder and co-CEO of Holistic AI. Is here, entrepreneur in the studios. Got a nice A round. Get some customers. You guys are in a hot area. Welcome to our studio and welcome to the Cube. Thank you, John. It's a real pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, kind of AI governance. Well, first of all, the risk management piece we've been covering a lot in the Cube because we saw governance really at the center of this about a year and a half ago when we started covering kind of the, the enablement from the chips. We then saw a lot of the data players like Snowflake and Databricks were basically data warehouses on the cloud. Then you start thinking, okay, they need to turn those data lakes into horizontally scalable data systems. We saw the agentic thing coming, we're seeing that now. You're seeing that the applications are infusing Gen AI and that's great innovation. That's well documented. We talk, that, talk about that all day long. And then when you have to roll that back to implementing it, a lot of people pull back and go, okay, what are the implications? Okay, LLMs on the foundation models that are public, hallucinations, they're getting bigger and bigger, not necessarily smarter and smarter, but bigger and smart. Long tail of proprietary models inside companies that are intellectual property. And so the, the instant thing that happens is, okay, what's the viability of it? What are the ethics? Ethics, not so much. Sure, that's a good point, mm. but it's more of, is it even workable? Yeah. Can we protect our data? What if there's passwords involved? So there's security implications. So the whole AI governance has become a thing because it's not like a siloed department anymore. It's not like just one thing. It's gotta be everywhere. So you guys are in the space, both have PhDs, both founders. You're in the hot market. You don't have the baggage from the old school. So you got the new, the new, the new look. What's your take on the whole compliance piece? What, did you see it as a data problem or you say, hey, there's a problem we're going to solve in this boring category called compliance? Absolutely. So John, just first and foremost to say thank you so much for this invitation. I just think it's just so, as we were kind of talking beforehand, governance is just way, way more than compliance. You know, yeah. this is not just a kind of tick box exercise. This is about enabling AI adoption across the enterprise. So what are we seeing? What are we actually seeing as we uh, in industry at the moment? Is we saw an explosion of interest, an explosion of kind of spend uh, from the kind of uh, 20, from late 2022 throughout 2023. Uh, and we've continued to see that in 2024. And what we're seeing at this point, what we're seeing is a lot of desire in enterprise to actually see some of the kind of killer use cases come to fruition. So we need to get these kind of rockets off the ground. And what are we seeing? About 80% of systems are stalling. And they're stalling for what reasons? They're stalling because of some kind of governance problem. And governance, as we see in a kind of broader sense, is yes, you've got these kind of frameworks of compliance or standards like NIST. In Europe, you've got the AI Act and so on and so forth. But then you've got other issues like bias. You've got issues like explainability. We don't even know why these systems are acting in the way that they're doing. We've got those other kind of issues like hallucination. And then finally, what we've got, and probably the most important thing, is efficacy, which is, you know, are these systems doing what they're supposed to do? So you've got a core issue of ROI. Uh, and what we do as a kind of enterprise, what we're seeing uh, across the board is that enter the governance layer is the mechanism to enable, if you will, AI transformation. Yeah, I want it's, it's about kind of collapsing the time to value. Yeah, I want to get into the company, but I want to stay in this thread first because it sets the table in the market because I mentioned boring category. I said that on purpose because uh, compliance and governance was pretty well defined. Yeah. You have data warehouses and it was procedural. You had some things you ran and it worked. Very few corner cases where you dealt with them. Now there's so much disruptive enablement going on where it's very active and changing. So there's a lot of changing variables that AI is throwing into the mix, as well as just technical underpinnings are enabling the apps that are putting pressure on the old compliance. Explain this nuance, because I think this is the real um, reason why compliance and governance and risk management and the role of CFO, CIO, CISO, application are all on this because it's a, it's, well, if you don't fix it, the value is not going to come there. Take us through your view on this. Totally, John, just to really concur with that, it's not, who do we engage with in enterprise? We actually engage typically with the CIO, CDO, sometimes with the CFO. And a kind of constituent, but not the kind of main leader of this conversation is, if you will, chief counsel or risk. Actually, what's taking place here is whoever owns the AI transformation in the business, whoever kind of owns the AI stack, whoever's responsible for this transformation is also responsible for the governance question. So the way I kind of tell the narrative is, hey, you went through data transformation. And hey, presto, what did we get at the end? We got data governance. Yeah. You went through cloud transformation. 
And what did you get? You got cloud governance. Now, who owns those? It's not, it's not in, in inherently a kind of risk officer or a compliance officer. It's still the same kind of, let's call it, technical C-suite. It's still a kind of C-suite issue. And what's happening with AI is something similar. What we're going through now is AI transformation, and what we're going to get is AI governance. Kind of we've, we've already kind of, we know how this story ends. Now, and just to kind of pick up on the point that you're making here, is what is the nature of the governance itself? And I try to say to people, why isn't it cloud governance? Why isn't it an extension of cloud or an extension of data governance? So on the one hand, it's analogous to data governance insofar as there were compliance concerns. Uh, and data governance was this kind of tick box exercise that you got to at a certain point. So it's analogous in that way in the sense that there are significant, significant kind of tailwinds mm -hmm. regarding the, um, uh, the use of these systems. And you're seeing huge interventions by mm -hmm federal uh, uh, agencies as well as state level and local level. On the other hand, it's disanalogous to data governance insofar as it's not static. It's not something that you just, it's not a form that you just kind of fill in. And then that's when you really start to see that you have to have a view on the algorithms themselves. The systems are alive. These systems are dynamic. So in order to do appropriate governance, you've got to have real-time monitoring. You've got to have verification of these systems. You've got to be able to interrogate the robustness of these things. So risk governance isn't this kind of compliance tick box, if you will, but actually it's much more to do with how do you actually interrogate these systems themselves. And just, John, just to kind of add there, there are novel risks associated with AI. So things like, for example, explainability in particular. Like there's, it's a particular kind of explainability. We know that these LLMs, for example, are in, from traditional understanding of explainability aren't, aren't explainable, so you have to use different methodologies. We know, for example, bias in these systems is a significant issue, uh, but robustness is a different class of problem. And even the problem of privacy, yeah. privacy with respect to these kinds of systems is not the same kind of privacy in the way that we saw in traditional data governance. So yeah. you've got to have a system that, if you will, straddles both the technical aspects of the system that's able to kind of meaningfully interrogate these algorithms, as well as that kind of layer that sits on top yeah. where you've got taxonomy of responsibility, uh, you've got documentation and processes yeah. in You know, place. Emory, it's interesting because what's exciting is, is that, you know, there's technical innovation and business model innovation. So <sighs> totally. there's a lot of stakeholders up and down the organization. That's why I brought the CFO. We're seeing more AI CFO conversations. It has nothing to do with finance. It's about, okay, I have to put new insurance in place. Well, our data is more valuable now, so therefore maybe the insurance changes. So oh, my risk profile with respect to my cyber posture. What does that look like? So, oh, I want to buy GPUs from the market. What's the hedge on my risk on CapEx? Yes. So like, it's like a serious uh, change, foundational change for every company. Yeah, totally. Just so even, even on the point of the most conservative stakeholder, in the uh, C-suite, if you're sometimes general counsel, I'm having conversations with them all the time and they're talking about how the most progressive ones are saying, hey, this thing is about enablement. Like we don't want to be the bad guys in the, in the <laughs> business that are just constantly yeah. frustrating innovation. This is a story about innovation, John. Yeah. This is a story about the winners of tomorrow are going to be defined by the, um, the pace at which they execute their AI, their AI transformation. Like this is a story, this is existential to the business, to the success of the business. You know, we study a lot. I mean, I, I like to study strategy, kind of like from a gamification standpoint, yeah. we look at business strategy. If you look at all the successful companies, they have a mission, a vision, a mission, and they have a strategy and tactics to go get that done. And the most successful companies have to match all the functional elements of the company to match and support the strategy. And it's not just sales, it's just the strategy. We're going to go change or make our application generative AI, or we're going to be the leader in X and use technology leverage to make our service better or my app better. So finance has to have a financial strategy that matches the business strategy. So you start to see the AI piece fall along your lines that you were saying is like, okay, hey, it's not so much about, you know, no, you can't do it. Yeah. The, the rules have changed because there's been a mandate and it's obvious to everybody <laughs> that there's going to be an enabler uh, Jensen Wong at NVIDIA calls it a category. Generative is a new category. It's not static, it's generating. Yeah. So everyone's got to be prepared. And every department, every vertical market. And so application review process, everything that's in the application will get done. So it's a category now. It's not even a, a new little tweak to yeah. finance or a new tweak to marketing or a new tweak to technology. It's a platform shift in every area. Oh, John, we just, I just totally agree with that. So let me just say also from the outset that, you know, John, and I'm sure we probably share this value. We're technologists. You know, we believe in this thing. <laughs> you know, like we believe in AI. We believe in the innovation. 
It's just that we want to ensure that we're able to do this in a way where companies are able to kind of maximize the yeah. value that they get from this in a way that makes sense to the business, that doesn't introduce uh, major risks to the business, existential risks to the business. So we're great believers in this yeah. thing. But kind of tallying that is, yes, and being brave enough as an enterprise, if you will, um, to say, hey, this, we can't solve this problem again by just yeah. adding a few questions to this or that kind of existing um, uh, 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 governance framework. You need an AI native uh, solution. You need something specifically built for AI. And that's what we're seeing here. Well, I'm super excited about the opportunity. Let's get into the, your company. Uh, introduce what Holistic does, share uh, the story, what problems you solve, talk about how you guys were founded, you got a co-founder. How did you guys get here? What's the origination story and, and what do you guys do? So John, let me just start off by saying we were academics. So okay. myself and my co-founder, I was, so we met at University College London. Uh, I'm very happy to say UCL was the home of DeepMind. Uh, DeepMind spun out of our department. And there was a consciousness at the time of, we were just so proud that we were at the forefront of this kind of revolutionary activity, um, really kind of innovating in these kind of systems. And we were conscious of that, that we wanted to kind of maximize the value of this thing uh, that was occurring within our kind of context, but we wanted to do so in a kind of trustworthy and, face, uh, uh, and, and safe manner. So Adriano was doing his PhD uh, in um, machine learning and finance, um, and he was just wrapping that up. I actually did my PhD in philosophy. John, you'll forgive me for that. I did it in, <laughs> <laughs> I did it in ethics and, um, and uh, actually a German philosopher. It was nothing to do with philosophy of science or technology, but I was very interested in this subject. And then I migrated over into computer science. Sorry. You well, you never say. know. I mean, you never. I mean, the, as I say, forget everything you learn because you the mental models you get from these other disciplines can absolutely help solve problems that are new. So, like, you know, I'm a big believer that no matter what your background is, if you have like a weird background like philosophy or archaeology, that may not be like you're not a math and science engineer as a huge advantage on the creativity coming. I think this is, I mean, you agree with that. Oh, obviously. John, you know, it's funny that my journey, if you will, was I started off, I did my undergraduate in chemistry. Uh, and then I did my postgraduate in chemical physics. <laughs> and we were looking at modeling the tips of carbon nanotubes. <laughs> so I was looking at quantum tunneling and so yeah. on. And then I just kind of switched yeah, into yeah. philosophy and I was interested in ethics. And then from there, it was a kind of very interesting one Sunday. Yeah. I wrote this article on how new digital technologies are forcing us yeah. to renegotiate the social contract. And then it got picked up by a mathematician in the computer science department at UCL, who was saying, hey, look, we're really interested yeah. in this problem of AI ethics. Um, kind of, we, we gave birth to this thing, so how are we going to ensure that the child <laughs> grows up in a disciplined manner? <laughs> so there was a really radical and experimental uh, yeah. context in which we were working. And we were trying to solve this problem of trust. Uh, and there were different ways we looked at it, John. We looked at certification. We looked at um, kind of compliance. We looked at all these uh, kind of things. And what we did in the end is we realized that what we've got to do is create some kind of mechanism to risk assess an algorithm mm -hmm. with a view to saying, hey, it's met this particular kind of uh, standard, and then we can say that this system is safe. Yeah. So it was in that context that we were working, very experimental yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, and Adriana and I were saying, my co-founder Adriana Koshyama and I were saying, hey, look, you know what, this is way too important to remain as some kind of research project. Yeah. John, I always say to people, I always say to, to fellow entrepreneurs that came out of the academy, you know, would you yeah. study medicine in the uh, library or would you study in the hospital? You know, in exactly the same way as we yeah. had to do this in the real world. Yeah. So we spun the company out thinking how we're going to maximize the impact. Um, and we got going, we yeah. got going in early 2020. And what we do, our mission is to empower enterprises to adopt and scale AI with confidence. Yeah. So this is really about that kind of AI transformation. Yeah. yeah, and this is exactly why I like what you guys are doing because it's like how, why you're in this area is not because you said, hey, we're going to solve a governance problem, some mechanism. You came at it from a holistic picture, pun intended. Absolutely. To say, hey, there's societal impact around the role of data. And you know, we see it in our, I'm, I'm writing a paper on trust networks right now because the queue is a big network and we're merging them together and we're making content and we're finding that the content has got a trust relationship. And, yeah. and we're in an era now where the data quality yeah. has to be strong. But now you got a data market where you have relevance, um, recency, the data, it's all changing so fast. So you really can't apply a static thing to an ever changing a chemistry process of data. And, and, and you know what, that was at, at the core of the product as it stands is, is exactly this interdisciplinarity. So what do we have really at the core level is you've got a set of technical tests. So what are we doing? We're risk assessing this algorithm. 
uh, with a view to explainability, bias, privacy, efficacy. And what, how are we doing that? We've got a whole host of technical tests that are run automatically on the platform that kind of generate this risk map for every single algorithm. And then what happens after that is if there is a risk, the risk if there is a risk that still exists, it gets mitigated. I'm happy to say, uh, John, and it's just something I'm, I'm really proud of, I think we've got the largest kind of open source uh, library on debiasing of algorithms. It's a kind of best in class um, uh, reference there. We've also got, so once you do the kind of mitigation, which we have these kind of uh, open source tools for, you've also got kind of monitoring, continuous monitoring, and we're doing all of that with a kind of automated generation of uh, reports that conform to all of those kind of standards and frameworks that we mentioned, NIST, AI Act, and so on and so forth. So that's the holistic tracker you have, the AI tracker? No. That's actually a separate thing. Separate so, thing. Okay. so what we're doing- explain, explain your open source stuff, then I'll come into some of the problems. Yeah, so there's two sides, the open source debiasing library that we had, uh, that we have, and, 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 and encourage everyone to go out there and, and, and check it out. And, and with a view to that, we've also got, and I should make a shout out, we've got a huge hackathon taking place at, uh, on the 23rd and 24th of this month. Uh, on, on solving two aspects of that problem. And then secondly, we've got this thing called a tracker. And John, the tracker came out of, um, we kind of make joke joke out of it, is when we first got going, we used to kind of motivate the problem by saying, hey, look, there's this incident that took place. This is, so when we got going 2018, you know, so like you were yeah. saying, it was before it was sexy. Yeah. Um, and we were saying, hey, something happened, that was an algorithm. Then it went from being headline of the month to headline of the week. Then it became headline of the day. And now we had to generate a kind of automated mechanism to kind of just pick up on these incidences, regulations, all these kind of events that are taking place. So we've got this open source tracker that people are able to go and see it's a kind of global map. You hover over it. You see if you want to use an algorithm or develop a system in a particular use case in a particular jurisdiction, you can have a quick look and see what's the kind of risk assessment for that. And that's something that's actually opened up and we opened it up to a general feed where people can kind of contribute articles and commentary and it's a fantastic community. So is that self-fulfilling? Is that uh, self-governed in, in the quality or you guys manage so, that? So algorithm? we've got a team. We've got a team that- So you, you do the algorithm. algorithm analysis? Yes, yes, yes. And then open source the results? Yes, and we do that and specifically also the kind of incidences and the legislative and other kind of standard body interventions. And the purpose of that is to keep help people keep up the date, right? Do you know what? We came from these communities. You know. <laughs> so it's like these two aspects of it. You know, Adriano's kind of background in machine learning and AI, and my background was in governance, philosophy. And in a way, we kind of got two of these open source yeah. communities yeah. that reflect that kind of genesis. We believe in this thing. We come from here. John. Yeah, open source, open always wins. Absolutely. Open always wins. And, and John, the thing is, it's really interesting because most of the time, what we're not interested in is kind of, especially when it comes to kind of of, let's say obscure technical knowledge or some kind of meat, some kind of really detailed interpretation of a piece of legislative text. That's not what we're interested in. Yeah. What we're interested in is just in, in general education, being part of that community, but actually at the core, uh, which is so these are the kind of general communities, but really it's that enterprise that's looking at how they're yeah. using algorithms in a really kind of fundamental and transformative fashion. Yeah. So yeah, so these are kind of parts of our <laughs> I guess a bunch of nerds really coming into this side. kind of the business culture. Absolutely. Let, let's get into the let's get into the uh, the business model and the product offering because you guys are startup series A, you're growing. Yep. You kind of got this go-to-market uh, phase of growth. So you have customers, you have revenue. Yep. So congratulations. Thank you. Uh, what do you guys how do, what do you guys have for a product? How is it consumed? Take us through the differentiators and what's the offering look like? So, so, so just really, at the, so we've got this platform. It's an AI governance platform, uh, uh, John. And at the core of it is this kind of single pane view of the use of AI across the, uh, uh, across the enterprise. Typically the kind of economic buyer is CIO or CDO. Uh, and what they're doing is they're saying, we want to have a bird's eye view of what's taking place. And at the core of it is aggregate risk, what is the kind of general risk posture? What's the risk appetite within the enterprise? But also tracking things like ROI. You know, are these things coming off? Are they uh, actually getting off the ground? Are we seeing a kind of um, consequence for these investments that we're making? So that's the kind of top level. And then we have the risk assessment. Every single algorithm is risk assessed. We do this thing through auto onboarding and a kind of auto uh, risk assessment, which quickly kind of maps and says, hey, quickly, this is a high risk or a low risk, medium risk system. And then it kind of moves through the kind of workflow that I described previously, which was verification, mitigation, um, uh, uh, monitoring, and then if you will, signing off. And all of this is done with a view to the kind of frameworks that exist out there. So like the NIST framework, the EU AI Act, 
Um, it could be local laws, uh, state laws, and so on and so forth. So really at the okay. core of it, what we have is this kind of single pane view of the use of AI across the business. Uh, so for the CFO audience out there, how does that translate into measurable ROI? Oh, so, so, so uh, John, we're seeing a total and utter, um, if you will, a kind of a desire in enterprise to get these rockets off the ground. It's something like 80% of systems aren't going anywhere. It takes about 14 months to get, to get a system off the ground. So what we're seeing is a huge amount of dollars going into this space, but actually not reali not seeing this. And they're not getting off the ground because of the governance? Because of the equation? governance problem, so that's, yes. That's a blocker. Yes, it's an absolute blocker. And what you want to do is kind of alleviate that. What are some of the questions that they have? What's, what are the blocker questions? So, so, so for example, sometimes, does it work? So, you know, we do, so does the system <laughs> yeah. work? That's a good you know, one. Can you, can you see the risks right at the point of ideation? You really don't want to be do uh, dumping a significant amount of dollars into a system and then yeah. five, or six data. months. Or oh, data, exactly. Um, so you've got these issues. Other issues like, can you be confident that the system is secure? Can you be confident that the system is not hallucinating? Does it meet a particular kind of standard for us to be able to use this in mission critical contexts? So you've got a huge amount of problems. If you're using in a, a, a customer facing algorithm, God, yeah. you know, can, yeah. you can you make sure that their system is not going to come up with some toxic statements, some hallucinations, and actually sometimes yeah. it's in terms of the bias in, yeah. with which it impacts different kinds of- Yeah, you, uh, have two, you have two areas inside the enterprise that are interested in your stuff from what I can gather. Technical audiences around transparency and guardrails, safeguards, yeah. if you will. Yeah. And then the business side is just, I need to understand how these compliance tools work for my job. Is that a flywheel that's tied together? Are there dependencies there? John, the story is at the core a business story. It's not a story about compliance. That's what we're seeing over and over again. What's happening is that the company is saying, hey, we're trying to go through this AI transformation. We've got to do two things. We've got to execute on the AI transformation. So the biggest risk to the business yeah. is not being able to do that. Yeah. And secondly, we want to make sure we're able to do this in a way where we can actually start deploying these systems. So really at the core of it is, what is the ROI? It's not about we spent X amount on the system yeah. and then we got this. It's actually, can we transform the business through? Uh, yeah. it's like Jensen everything. Wong said, you guys are in a new category because Absolutely. it's compliance is a feature of the business transformation with AI because if AI doesn't work, there's no business. Notice uh, two things. I looked at a recent um, uh, Gartner report on what are the two big trends in the next year. Number one, agentic AI. Makes sense, yep. right? Number two, AI governance. These two things go hand in hand. The ability to be able to use these systems yeah. uh, requires or is premised on good governance, appropriate governance. Yeah. You know, you're not just going to let these systems run out in the wild. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to say, uh, John, I should have probably mentioned that before, but we're working with some of the best companies in the world here. Yeah, give some examples. Unilever, Siemens, uh, Michelin, Matfrey, one of the, uh, Starling Bank, uh, Mindbridge, one of the really interesting yeah. startups. Writer, the LLM company. Yeah. So we've got a, um, um, you know, a, a, a great What's the set scope of, of the relationship and how are they engaging with you? So we've got two kinds of relationships. So one side with the enterprise, what's happening is the enterprise is saying, hey, we're going through this AI transformation. We want good governance in place. And what we want to do is have a certain level of confidence in systems that we're developing and systems that we're buying. So we're able to work with both sides. And we're ha I'm happy to say with like large enterprises, uh, that we're working with. In some cases, we're managing yeah. hundreds of algorithms for them. And it's uh, this kind of single pane view that I, I mentioned before yeah. for that kind of C-suite view. <laughs> and on the other end of yeah. the spectrum is, are these AI companies. Yeah. A lot of these AI companies come to us and yeah, say- they need hedge. Hey, Risk look, man. you know. <laughs> they're going <laughs> yeah, so yeah. fast, can you just help uh, us? Uh, but, but also, John, when they're going to market, yeah. they want to be able to say, yeah. hey, look, um, don't believe us. You know, we've had best in class assurance here, best in class risk management. Yeah, but they're moving so fast. And so Absolutely. they need a partner there too, because they don't want, they don't have time to look the other way. They want a partner Absolutely. to, to Absolutely. have the both rockets come up. That's interesting. You know, the, 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 um, the market's moving so fast. It is a need to have, in a way, you're like AI observability on the algorithms. Yeah. You're like yeah. watching everything, yes. keeping track of it, but it, it solves the compliance problem yes. as, as well as other problems yes. solve. Yes, totally, totally. So what we're seeing is exactly that. It's saying, okay, hang on a minute. Um, we can't, it, 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 a lot of the time, if you go to the C-suite, John, you ask them a simple question, ask the CFO, CIO, whatever. How many systems do you have in the business? You know, you get this kind of moment <laughs> of uh, concern. So like there is a- That we know of? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they so, all say the same thing. Exactly, that's exactly. It's getting worse too. It's more, how much data do you have? Uh, I don't know. And John, imagine the, the kind of applications of these yeah. systems. You know, you're, yeah. you're basically having these highly, um, 
uh, consequential systems just running amok within the business. Well, the thing that we just wrote a post about saying Jamie Dimon's new is the new competitor to Sam Altman because they have more petabytes than Altman's crawling on JP Morgan. Mm. So that's intellectual property. Yeah. They have to do their own thing on that. Yeah. So they're going to need uh, all this kind of observability data around out what algorithms are running, what's the state of the art, does it need to be refreshed? John, the real question is which part of the business is not being transformed by, yeah. uh, by AI? You know, how can the C-suite not? The, I mean, this is existential. Yeah. So I always say this to, you know, this is how we, what we're seeing. If you don't automate, it's an existential risk to the business. Yeah. If you automate, it's an existential risk to the business because you introduce <laughs> all these kind of risks into the business. All right, final question. Great to have you. We'll, have, we'll do more coverage now. That you, I know you live in Palo Alto. We have plenty of opportunities to do more yeah, just deep dives. Um, I mean, you guys have got, I love the, 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 the creative because we're in a problem solving world that's art and science right now. It's yeah. The, the leaders are in this way because it's emerging. It's creativity, it's totally. productivity, it's also technology. And, and this is a unique time in this secular trend. It's definitely totally an inflection point. We've been covering that. But what's your vision? If you had to say your future vision and give us an update on your growth status, funding. I'm sure you guys got a lot of term sheets coming your way, getting thrown at you. You got to make a decision. Uh, give us the vision and, and where you guys are in the growth. Yeah, John, we're growing phenomenally well. Uh, we keep growing. Our customer base is just expanding um, you know, month on month. So we're continuing to grow. Our real kind of growth area is in the enterprise. So really they're concerned with having a kind of infrastructure layer in place. So that's been a kind of phenomenal win for us. All of the growth is here in the US. Uh, what's interesting, and again, I kind of uh, uh, go back to the point of, even though we're seeing a significant amount of activity with the EU AI Act, actually what people are interested in, what enterprises are interested in here in the US is very much about just good governance, the kind of business story, AI transformation across the business. Uh, as a kind of company, yep, we continue to grow. We're still great believers yeah. in our identity in terms of we still have research taking place. Yeah. We still have people from both UCL and from Stanford still have that kind of relationship. But at the core, what, what it is, our vision is yeah. to become the trusted partner, is yeah. to become the kind of story, the, the way in which Intel has this kind of brand and you know that if they've been Intel uh, certified in the same way as Holistic certified, to know that your systems yeah. are safe and reliable. Everyone wants to have a holistic view. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, Dave Vellante and I, uh, I think we're the first media company to actually use the term SLM, because we had our own language model. This is years ago, two years ago. Now, SLM is not just small language model, it's sovereign language models, it's yeah. security language models. Yes. I mean, so much going on in the changing infrastructure landscape that things like sovereignty and nations, different nations have different things and who's managing it, it's things that are being stood up and generated, like who tracks all that? You know, it's so funny, I never thought of it in those times, but that's, that's a great way of thinking about it. You've yeah. got to have sovereignty over your AI assets. You've got to have this kind of, yeah. I think of ourselves, the vision for us is the same way that Workday is the kind of management of human capital, Holistic AI is the management of, of your AI capital. Yeah. The Cube had, uh, was all over Agentic. We've got great body work on thecuberesearch.com. Everyone's watching, want to check it out. The area we're doing now is causal AI, because it's going to be not just reasoning and reinforcing, where's, what's the causation totally. of things? Totally. And that's going to have an impact. There's going to be a data supply chain, all kinds of lineage and, other data that's not just database driven. John, I'm a, I'm, there is no doubt in my mind we're at the beginning. Yeah. I mean, is there, I mean, for, for, for many yeah. of us, this is probably going to yeah. be the most single most important technological advancement. Um, yeah. I was mentioning, and I won't say who it was, but you know who I was talking about, was talking about how he's only seen three of these kind of events. Yeah. You know, the internet, you know, <laughs> the, the personal computer, AI. Yeah. You know, so we're, so we're just at the beginning of this yeah. thing. And it's I'm, definitely a super cycle for sure. Emery, thanks for coming in the studio. Appreciate it. Congratulations. We'll be tracking you. We'll be fantastic. seeing you around. Thanks for coming in. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. And just a fantastic uh, uh, podcast you got here. Thanks. I'm Jeff. We're here in our Palo Alto studios, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.